Chapter Thirty Six of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Clett, Houston, Texas, June two thousand eight. Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, written by herself, by Harriet Jacobs, written under the pseudonym Linda Brent. Chapter Thirty Six: The Hair Breadth Escape. After we returned to New York, I took the earliest opportunity to go and see Ellen. I asked to have her called downstairs, for I supposed Mrs. Hobbs's southern brother might still be there, and I was desirous to avoid seeing him if possible. But Mrs. Hobbs came to the kitchen and insisted on my going upstairs. "'My brother wants to see you,' said she, "'and he is sorry you seem to shun him. He knows you are living in New York. He told me to say to you that he owes thanks to good old Aunt Martha for too many little acts of kindness for him to be base enough to betray her grandchild. This Mr. Thorne had become poor and reckless long before he left the South, and such persons had much rather go to one of the faithful old slaves to borrow a dollar, or get a good dinner, than to go to one whom they consider an equal. It was such acts of kindness as these for which he professed to feel grateful to my grandmother. I wished he had kept at a distance. But as he was here, and knew where I was, I concluded there was nothing to be gained by trying to avoid him. On the contrary, it might be the means of exciting his ill-will. I followed his sister upstairs. He met me in a very friendly manner, congratulated me on my escape from slavery, and hoped I had a good place where I felt happy. I continued to visit Ellen as often as I could. She, good, thoughtful child, never forgot my hazardous situation, but always kept a vigilant lookout for my safety. She never made any complaint about her own inconveniences and troubles, but a mother's observing eye easily perceived that she was not happy. On the occasion of one of my visits I found her unusually serious. When I asked her what was the matter, she said nothing was the matter. But I insisted upon knowing what made her look so very grave. Finally I ascertained that she felt troubled about the dissipation that was continually going on in the house. She was sent to the store very often for rum and brandy, and she felt ashamed to ask for it so often, and Mr. Hobbs and Mr. Thorne drank a great deal, and their hands trembled so that they had to call her to pour out the liquor for them. "'But for all that,' said she, "'Mr. Hobbs is good to me, and I can't help liking him. I feel sorry for him.' I tried to comfort her by telling her that I had laid up a hundred dollars, and that before long I hoped to be able to give her and Benjamin a home and send them to school. She was always desirous not to add to my troubles more than she could help, and I did not discover till years afterwards that Mr. Thorne's intemperance was not the only annoyance she suffered from him. Though he professed too much gratitude to my grandmother to injure any of her descendants, he had poured vile language into the ears of her innocent great-grandchild. I usually went to Brooklyn to spend Sunday afternoon. One Sunday I found Ellen anxiously waiting for me near the house. "'Oh, mother,' said she, "'I've been waiting for you this long time. I'm afraid Mr. Thorne has written to tell Dr. Flint where you are. Make haste and come in. Mrs. Hobbs will tell you all about it.' The story was soon told. While the children were playing in the grapevine arbor the day before, Mr. Thorne came out with a letter in his hand, which he tore up and scattered about. Ellen was sweeping the yard at the time, and having her mind full of suspicions of him, she picked up the pieces and carried them to the children, saying, "'I wonder who Mr. Thorne has been writing to.' "'I'm sure I don't know, and don't care,' replied the oldest of the children, "'and I don't see how it concerns you.' "'But it does concern me,' replied Ellen, "'for I'm afraid he's been writing to the South about my mother.' They laughed at her, and called her a silly thing, but good-naturedly put the fragments of writing together in order to read them to her. They were no sooner arranged than the little girl exclaimed, "'I declare, Ellen, I believe you are right!' The contents of Mr. Thorne's letter, as nearly as I can remember, were as follows. "'I have seen your slave, Linda, and conversed with her. She can be taken very easily if you manage prudently. There are enough of us here to swear to her identity as your property. I am a patriot.' a lover of my country, and I do this as an act of justice to the laws." He concluded by informing the doctor of the street and number where I lived. The children carried the pieces to Mrs. Hobbs, who immediately went to her brother's room for an explanation. He was not to be found. The servants said they saw him go out with a letter in his hand, and they supposed he had gone to the post-office. The natural inference was that he had sent to Dr. Flint a copy of those fragments. When he returned, his sister accused him of it 
and he did not deny the charge. He went immediately to his room, and the next morning he was missing. He had gone over to New York before any of the family were astir. It was evident that I had no time to lose, and I hastened back to the city with a heavy heart. Again I was to be torn from a comfortable home, and all my plans for the welfare of my children were to be frustrated by that demon slavery. I now regretted that I never told Mrs. Bruce my story. I had not concealed it merely on account of being a fugitive. That would have made her anxious. But it would have excited sympathy in her kind heart. I valued her good opinion, and I was afraid of losing it, if I told her all the particulars of my sad story. But now I felt that it was necessary for her to know how I was situated. I had once left her abruptly, without explaining the reason, and it would not be proper to do it again. I went home resolved to tell her in the morning. But the sadness of my face attracted her attention, and in answer to her kind inquiries I poured out my full heart to her, before bedtime. She listened with true womanly sympathy, and told me she would do all she could to protect me. How my heart blessed her! Early the next morning, Judge Vanderpool and Lawyer Hopper were consulted. They said I had better leave the city at once, as the risk would be great if the case came to trial. Mrs. Bruce took me in a carriage to the house of one of her friends, where she assured me I should be safe until my brother should arrive, which would be in a few days. In the interval my thoughts were much occupied with Ellen. She was mine by birth, and she was also mine by southern law, since my grandmother held the bill of sale that made her so. I did not feel that she was safe unless I had her with me. Mrs. Hobbs, who felt badly about her brother's treachery, yielded to my entreaties, on condition that she should return in ten days. I avoided making any promise. She came to me clad in very thin garments, all outgrown, and with a school satchel on her arm containing a few articles. It was late in October, and I knew the child must suffer, and not daring to go out in the streets to purchase anything, I took off my own flannel skirt and converted it into one for her. Kind Mrs. Bruce came to bid me good-bye, and when she saw that I had taken off my clothing for my child, the tears came to her eyes. She said, "'Wait for me, Linda.' and went out. She soon returned with a nice warm shawl and hood for Ellen. Truly, of such souls as hers are the kingdom of heaven. My brother reached New York on Wednesday. Lawyer Hopper advised us to go to Boston by the Stonington route, as there was less southern travel in that direction. Mrs. Bruce directed her servants to tell all inquirers that I formerly lived there, but had gone from the city. We reached the steamboat Rhode Island in safety. The boat employed colored hands, but I knew that colored passengers were not admitted to the cabin. I was very desirous for the seclusion of the cabin, not only on account of exposure to the night air, but also to avoid observation. Lawyer Hopper was waiting on board for us. He spoke to the stewardess and asked as a particular favor that she would treat us well. He said to me, "'Go and speak to the captain yourself by and by. Take your little girl with you, and I am sure he will not let her sleep on deck.' With these kind words and a shake of the hand, he departed. The boat was soon on her way, bearing me rapidly from the friendly home where I had hoped to find security and rest. My brother had left me to purchase the tickets, thinking that I might have better success than he would. When the stewardess came to me, I paid what she asked, and she gave me three tickets with clipped corners. In the most unsophisticated manner, I said, "'You have made a mistake. I asked you for cabin tickets.' I cannot possibly consent to sleep on deck with my little daughter. She assured me that there was no mistake. She said on some of the routes colored people were allowed to sleep in the cabin, but not on this route, which was much travelled by the wealthy. I asked her to show me to the captain's office, and she said she would after tea. When the time came, I took Ellen by the hand and went to the captain, politely requesting him to change our tickets, as we should be very uncomfortable on deck. He said it was contrary to the custom, but he would see that we had berths below. He would also try to obtain comfortable seats for us in the cars. Of that he was not certain, but he would speak to the conductor about it, when the boat arrived. I thanked him, and returned to the ladies' cabin. He came afterwards and told me that the conductor of the cars was on board, that he had spoken to him, and he had promised to take care of us. I was very much surprised at receiving so much kindness. I don't know whether the pleasing face of my little girl had won his heart, or whether the stewardess inferred from Lawyer Hopper's manner that I was a fugitive, and had pleaded with him in my behalf. When the boat arrived at Stonington, the conductor kept his promise, and showed us to seats in the first car nearest the engine. He asked us to take seats next the door, but as he passed through, we ventured to move on toward the other end of the car. No incivility was offered us, and we reached Boston in safety. 
The day after my arrival was one of the happiest of my life. I felt as if I was beyond the reach of the bloodhounds, and for the first time during many years I had both my children together with me. They greatly enjoyed their reunion, and laughed and chatted merrily. I watched them with a swelling heart. Their every motion delighted me. I could not feel safe in New York, and I accepted the offer of a friend that we should share expenses and keep house together. I represented to Mrs. Hobbs that Ellen must have some schooling, and must remain with me for that purpose. She felt ashamed of being unable to read or spell at her age, so instead of sending her to school with Benny, I instructed her myself till she was fitted to enter an intermediate school. The winter passed pleasantly, while I was busy with my needle, and my children with their books. End of chapter 36